Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to just give it one minute and allow all the attendees in waiting to join the, the main room here. Just bear with us. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started and allow the other attendees to join as they come in. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jeremy Hafner, Chancellor here at the University of Denver, and it's my delight to host the first uh, fall quarter webinar town hall meeting of the parents and families of our students and it's absolutely just great that you're joining us today we are in week five i can't believe already uh almost halfway done with the fall term uh and so excited so excited to have uh your student with us um here on campus or in our classes in one form or another I'm going to give a quick overview of what we've learned in the past few weeks, as well as some highlights of our successes. So I'll do that. Um, and then I'm going to invite Provost Mary Clark to come and talk for just a few moments about uh, really what you can expect moving forward, especially in the winter and spring quarters. Then she'll invite Stephanie O'Malley, who is our Associate Vice Chancellor for Government and Community Relations, and she's going to talk about some of DU protocols and how they relate to the city of Denver, uh, because our partner is the city of Denver, and we work very, very closely with them to ensure that, of course, our faculty, students, and staff, as well as the surrounding community members are, are safe and healthy. And then finally, we're going to leave plenty of time for Q and A, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to I'm going to introduce the other panelists that are with us here. You've um, seen uh, Mary Clark wave already. You've seen uh, Stephanie O'Malley wave already. Um, we have a brand new Vice Chancellor for a Student Affairs, Todd Adams. Todd, would you wave to the group? Michael Lafar. Many of you have seen before, he's our executive director of the Health and Counseling Center. Sarah Watamora is our COVID-19 response coordinator and of course, faculty member and department chair uh, in our department of psychology as well. And then finally, uh, as a panelist, we have Mike Holt, who is our interim director of campus safety and there he's waving as well. So, all of these individuals will be helping us um, answer questions live. We also have a team behind the scenes that will be answering your questions uh, through the Q&A. And we do invite you to use the Q&A to send your messages forward to us. All right, so uh, let me talk a little bit about how things are going on campus. And I, I couldn't be more proud of how things are really um, working out extraordinarily well. Um, so with, with the first aspect, I want to express some great gratitude to especially our students, uh, right? We have um, put them into an environment that is much unlike their typical college kind of experience that uh, either the continuing students expected or uh, the new students might have um, aspired for. And they are behaving for the most part, extraordinarily well. I uh, am on campus a lot. My wife and I come on campus in the weekends uh, and we see students wearing masks, 
staying physically distant, um, respecting all the other protocols. Um, and I'm really proud of them in so many different ways. Yes, we've had a few, few students to take liberties with the protocols, and I'm sure we'll be talking about those as well. But for the most part, our students are responding extraordinarily well. I just wanna thank them for their behaviors and for their resilience. I wanna thank the families though too. You've been supporting the students along the way. Uh, and that is incredibly important in a time that is so unlike other times that we've had at the University of Denver. Our faculty and staff are just um, rock stars for us. Uh, faculty delivering, of course, the coursework in a variety of new modes and uh, different ways of delivering courses. Our staff that are here, the staff that are working behind the scenes as well, are just um, um, wonderful ambassadors for the university, making sure that students are well cared for, um, that their questions are answered and, and they're supported in so many different ways. It, it literally took a monumental effort by so many people, um, but it has paid off because of where we are today. I'm very, very appreciative of all the work that's been done. Um, you know, our first and foremost principle has been always to look out for the health and safety of our community members. Um, and we keep that at the very top of the list of our priorities when we're making decisions. The one that's right next to it, of course, is the educational experience that our students are having. And I hope that through the course of today's Q&A, you learn more about that commitment. Equity, because we know that COVID is not equitable at how it treats everyone is another issue or another principle that we bring to our decision-making process as well. All of this, of course, the environment that we find ourselves in does take its mental toll on our students, on our faculty and staff for that matter. Um, and we're certainly making sure that uh, we care for them and that we have plenty of resources to help support uh, their mental health as well as their physical health. We're trying to listen um, uh, not only to our students, but to you parents. This event that we have today is just an example of that. I thought I'd share though now just some lessons learned um, that we've taken away because while I'm very proud of where we are, everyone knows that it's not perfect. Um, and so some lessons that we've, we've learned along the way is that we have always made sure that we could do more about communicating with our students, especially when we're requesting um, focused testing. Uh, this, this is a, a process that we've learned over the course of the last five weeks. There have been pockets of uh, some indications where we wanted to do some more testing and how we went about that, giving them enough time. Those were some things we took away from that, better communication with our students. So that's one lesson. A second lesson was to make sure that when a student is tested positive and they do go into isolation or they've been in contact with someone who has tested positive and they have to go into quarantine, that we make this process as comfortable as possible for them because it is already uh, uh, a situation that creates some anxiety among our students. So we've listened and, and learned to them about what we could do better to make sure that uh, the experience of our students either in isolation or in quarantine is the best possible. And the third um, lesson learned, I think, is really helping to set high standards for behavior expectations, but also providing outlets for important social interactions. And we've heard a lot from parents, uh, and that has helped uh, us provide even more activities. I'm sure you'll hear from uh, Vice Chancellor Adams today about some of those activities. So those are some of the lessons learned. Uh, and there's been lots and lots and lots of successes that I thought I'd share with you though. Uh, I'm quite pleased with the fact that um, we have increased those social interactions. Uh, and now um, Dr. Adams is actually sending out messages on a weekly basis to help students really take advantage of some of those activities. He sent one last Friday. Uh, that gave not only activities on campus, but some safe activities to do in the city of Denver. Our relationship with National Jewish Health, which is our 
healthcare advisor when it comes to the responding to COVID has been extraordinarily helpful um, and very pleased with their work in supporting our testing. They are managing all of our testing now. Um, they're also giving us advice on our protocols and how we go about you know, working with isolation and quarantine structures as well. So that's been extraordinarily a positive experience. As I mentioned earlier, um, the city of Denver is our partner in this. We're working hard with uh, Denver Health Department to make sure that we are quick and responsive to any outbreaks of the virus that might be occurring, working both um, with the city as well as the state on that. We're, we're happy that that is moving along very nicely. Um, our faculty, I've already kind of mentioned how grateful I am for their willingness to really provide flexible options. Um, this, is, this is hard for them to balance both an online course and a face-to-face -face course simultaneously. That's what we call high flex. Um, and, they're, and they're doing a wonderful job at learning and making adjustments as they go. Our contact tracing, um, there's, two, there's two features that uh, have proven to be very successful in helping us manage the virus in many respects. And one is testing and one is on uh, our contact tracing. Uh, we have been very successful at getting the campus community to download our contact tracing digital app. That's called Everbridge. We now have a 70% compliance with um, our community, which is phenomenal. Um, that is the kind of participation that we need to see it fully reap its benefits, if you will. We also have manual contact tracing. So people are calling people on the phone uh, to try to make sure that we um, reach out to those that might have been exposed to a positive case. And then I think, uh, and this is really attributable to a, a, a very large team that Sarah Watamora runs, and that is our quick responsiveness uh, when we get the slightest indication that there may be some cases emerging. We, we have now implemented um, a wastewater diagnosis. Um, so the wastewater actually gives us quite a bit of a heads up of a possible uh, positive case, whether it's in the residence halls or elsewhere on campus. And we act quickly uh, then to decide whether additional testing is necessary on that. And so uh, a big success of the university has been that responsiveness. So I hope this gives you a little bit of sense of um, where we are today. Uh, I'm very positive. I'm so grateful you're joining us. And now I'm gonna ask Provost Mary Clark to give us a little indication of what to expect in the future. Very good, very good. And I'm glad to do so. Hello everyone. And building on all that we've learned from the fall quarter, we've been thinking ahead to the winter and spring quarter. Our guiding principles, of course, are health and safety of your students and the quality of their experience, their academic experience, their co-curricular experience. Uh, we're mindful that uh, students uh, relish being challenged in the classroom, and they also relish the social connections with their peers, with faculty and staff on campus. So we're looking um, at how to balance uh, all of these different interests. I think, uh, some of the lessons that we learned from the fall that we plan to implement moving forward include the importance of a sequenced uh, return to campus. So we're looking at um, sequencing the return to campus in order to de-densify that particular uh, experience. Uh, we're also looking at uh, the uh, importance of quarantining uh, students um, and testing as the chancellor highlighted, uh, we think it's aggressive uh, testing um, that has really enabled us uh, to be so successful as compared with many of our peers. And so we'll continue to do that. Uh, but I mentioned these by way of saying, uh, we're really um, focused on health and safety first, uh, and then also on the quality uh, of the experience that your students will enjoy, both in the classroom, 
uh, as well as the co-curricular. Uh, we do anticipate a return to residential experience uh, in January and just want to be very clear about that. Um, would welcome your further questions when we get to that time. Uh, but right now I'd like to turn it to Stephanie O'Malley, who is our Associate Vice Chancellor for External Affairs and Government Relations. So thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, uh, Dr. Clark. Um, I'm glad to be here and happy to share. Um, the Chancellor did ask me to talk a little bit about um, our relationship with our government partners, including the city and county of Denver, as well as the state of Colorado. And I'm happy to say that through this whole COVID experience, we've had a robust relationship and engagement with both the city of Denver and the state of Colorado. As everyone will know, back in March, uh, the state of Colorado issued a, our first stay at home order. And we here at DU very quickly uh, were responsive to the order uh, and acted very quickly to get all of our students, faculty and staff safe um, by sending them home and abiding by that particular order. Uh, the second order that came out in April, the Safer at Home order, um, the one that remains in effect today actually allowed for businesses and activities to open up a little bit, but certainly uh, co continues to demand that uh, uh, social distancing be subscribed to, the wearing of face masks be subscribed to, uh, engaging in great hygiene practices be subscribed to, and these are the things that the university in a great yeoman way has been uh, paying hefty attention to on behalf of everyone in our university campus. Uh, our protect our neighbors order is the one in which uh, the governor is in right now and the state is in right now. Uh, that was effective October the 5th. And it just provides for some broader openings of the economy, if you will, but still requires that uh, the University of Denver and others provide evidence of their ability to conduct testing in a very robust way. Uh, that we'll also have to be um, paying attention to things like, you know, when we do have our community members test positive, what are we doing in response to that? You've heard a little bit about the things that we have in terms of quarantining and having folks separated from others on campus. We have a hefty program related to that. And I'm sure Dr. Watamura can speak more about that later. And then we also have to demonstrate that we do have those relationships with our public health partners and a public health system within the university system that is responsive to COVID-19 related matters. We've done those things in a very hefty and robust way and are proud of them. Uh, as you know, the governor may um, on October the 9th, he extended the mandatory uh, executive order that requires everyone to wear a face mask if they're outside. Uh, again, this provides for safety. Uh, for our uh, university community. We've done a lot uh, across the campus to remind all of our campus community the importance of wearing a mask. There's signage all over this campus uh, and adjacent to the campus. We've visited some of our neighboring businesses, providing them with signage that really just simply speaks to DU doing its part uh, to do these things, to wear your mask, to social distance, to be aware of the hygiene things that are required by the state and local orders. Uh, on the September the 24th, the city and county of Denver separately did issue an order specific to higher education institutions. And it requires us to do things that quite frankly, DU had already been engaged in. Uh, as an example, conducting the daily health screenings of our students to notify the Denver Department of Health and Environment uh, within 24 hours of confirmed cases, uh, increase our efforts to strict adherence to the base um, mask requirements and uh, do some things re um, related to our athletes in our athletic department. So we're proud to say that our robust actions uh, in response to these things continue and we'll continue to partner with both the city and county of Denver and the state of Colorado to be subscriptive to their orders and executive orders. Thank you. Look forward to your questions. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, now we're gonna to get to some questions and answers. And I see that they've been kind of queuing up in the Q and A. Um, I am going to start with uh, one that's at the top of the list here because I think it's on uh, the minds of several people. I'm going to, uh, Todd, I'm gonna to invite Thomas Walker to come on because he is in your division and he leads the uh, housing and residential life um, to talk about 
uh, moving out at the end of the quarter. Thomas, um, would you pop on and uh, share what uh, they need to know in terms of, do they have to move their stuff out? Do they, what, what do they have to do at the end of the quarter? Sure, thanks, uh, Chancellor Hefner. Um, so we, uh, at the moment, the, the hope is that we will not require folks to move everything out. Um, as with a lot of the stuff that we're doing, we, we have to adjust to what the circumstances in the current moment are. Um, so I know that we, we've provided earlier in the year the possibility that we would ask um, first year students particularly to move everything out. We're hoping that's not going to be the case, but we are still looking at that and I hope to have a definitive answer for that um, in the next couple of weeks. So I know a lot of people are, are asking about that. We realize that it's an inconvenience to, to do that. Um, and so we're trying to avoid it. So we'll watch for um, the, the, the final word on that coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, and if uh, another person had asked me recently why the difference between first year halls and the others. Um, and that's primarily because first year residence halls don't have kitchens and there's no dining services over the break. Um, and so first years, we, we don't have a way to feed them or for they, them to feed themselves. And that's why that distinction is there. The upper class halls that have uh, kitchens in their apartments um, or suites um, are able to stay because they can feed themselves. So that's the, the quick and dirty version of that. And I'll keep watching for other questions in the Q&A. Well, and Thomas, um, I think one of the specific questions was, do they have to have to move their stuff out if uh, if they're asked to leave the dorms and at, at that point in time? Is is that still up in the air as well? Yes. Uh, so okay. we, we, we that was a possibility. Um, uh, if we do kind of a harder close, we don't think we're coming back for winter quarter. We don't know that yet. Um, and so again, we we that had been a possibility. But at the moment, the the hope is that we won't have to ask that they can leave whatever they don't need to be able to access for the break. But again, in a couple of weeks, we'll have a, a final decision on that and communicate that out. Very good. And of course, um, everyone uh, around this grid uh, is making assumptions and plans, of course, that we're going to be open uh, back on, uh, in the winter quarter. So the next question really is for Todd directly. Um, so Todd, the question is, uh, you know, what are the possibilities for social activity interaction for students outside, especially first year students that need to build community and friendships? Um, the writer goes on to say multiple universities are hosting events that must be signed up for that are socially distanced, movies, dodgeball, uh, outdoor spaces with fire pits and chairs and so forth that are socially distanced. Why don't you talk a little bit about what DU is doing in that space? And you're muted. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Hafner, and, and thank you also to Thomas for the good work being done in residential education as well. Um, we, we have a number of, of activities and programs that are happening, uh, much like you detailed, and some of them more informal and then some of them more formal that might require some form of registration or sign up. Um, we've been very, very fortunate that the weather has cooperated so much this fall that advantaging outdoor spaces has been a big part of what we've done, where we've had small gatherings, 10 or fewer students, and then I just came from a larger sponsored activity that probably had close to our maximum of 50 socially distanced face coverings um, and the like um, that, that are occurring on a regular basis daily. We um, had the opportunity to launch Crimson Connect, which is a platform for student groups and students uh, to connect around engagement opportunities. And that was really planned in advance of COVID, but during COVID has been a very important way for students to know what's available on each day uh, to get reminders, but it's also the platform by which groups can sign up for events and get those approved. Um, as you mentioned, Chancellor, I've, I've sent out to students in each of the last couple of weeks um, a variety of events that are happening. It's just a small number of them, um, but we've had dozens of, of formal events, some of them um, done virtually, uh, given the size of them, more than 50 people or the nature of them, it worked better to do virtually. And that was often at the request of the student group. Um, and in a number of cases, we've, we've done uh, in-person events on campus and in nearby areas. And so those have, have also occurred. I think what's important is that we've, we've partnered a lot with athletics and recreation to use spaces that 
um, perhaps haven't always been um, used by students as regularly to open up those, um, those venues to make sure that students have access um, also to some, some places for fun. Um, we've done a lot of pop-up events where there have been big games on the quad where students can just come upon them and, and play with faculty or staff. And I've attended two or three of those where I've, I've come around. So those have worked quite well. And then with dining, we're seeing students um, frequently choose to take their meals outside um, and to sit with others. And so that's been, that's been very good. We did a virtual organization fair a couple of weeks ago after students were back and student leaders were in place. And that attracted over a thousand students and I think 126 student organizations. So we saw some really good connections being made there. And now those student organizations as they have recruited some new members are beginning to plan and do events yet here in October and, and even some planned for November. So it's, it's been robust. We've, we've learned some things along the way. We're trying to use every available space, some of it inside, a lot of it outside. Um, and you heard Stephanie O'Malley uh, mention area businesses where we know our students may frequent for a, a meal or some form of activity. And to that end, the university has worked to uh, outreach to those businesses, share some of what we're doing in the hopes that that helps them provide safe and healthy options for students too. So all of that is going on. And then I, I should also offer for students who live on campus, their resident advisors, their RAs, um, their graduate resident directors and the resident directors are scheduling and doing a lot of programming, some of it in larger groups, but a lot of it in smaller groups by pod or by floor and in some individual interactions. So those have, have been ongoing. Great, while I've got you, Todd, there's a question about what are the plans for athletics and recreation in the in the winter quarter quarter. So maybe you and I can tag team that one. Um, why don't you start? So I, I think we're we're learning as we go along in what what athletics will have. And I know um, Director Creech um, is not here, and maybe uh, Chancellor, you can talk a little bit about where the Summit League is and what we might see that way. Um, obviously, the Rich, Ritchie Center is available, and we've had that open, and it's been getting quite a bit of use. Um, some of the outdoor spaces, depending on the day, may be available, and then again, may not be. So we've talked about ways that we might be able to configure some of the indoor spaces to allow for some activity, um, probably with sign up, because it's important that we know when people are coming, who's coming, and then also have some space in between there to get equipment or, or facilities uh, appropriately clean for who might be coming next. So all of that is is underway. And right now we're, we're just attempting to use every available space, primarily outdoors, but some of that will shift, uh, we hope, to some indoor spaces that we can access uh, when the weather starts to turn. Great. And um, I can give a, a little bit of an update in terms of the actual athletics and the competition. Uh, we are beginning to get greater clarity from the conferences and of course NCAA. Um, we have our fall sports which were postponed until the spring and so the Summit League is the conference that kind of governs their activities. Uh, they are working now on plans to have uh, spring competitions starting even in late January through February, March. Um, so uh, we will have men's and women's soccer, uh, volleyball. Those are the sports that uh, likely will come forward as, along with golf and tennis. It might be a little chillier than the usual fall sports, but it will still be great to see the student athletes out there. Hockey uh, is likely to start late November, play in December. There is uh, some wonderful plans uh, of a, a kind of a, an extended tournament in December where it will be um, protocol safe, if you will. Uh, we'll put uh, the teams all together in a location, probably either in North Dakota or in, or in Kansas City that uh, will be uh, quite safe for the players to have several games at. Uh, gymnastics starts in January and we're on track for that. We anticipate that. Um, participation from fans will be, of course, limited. Um, protocols will allow us only at this point in time uh, to have the number be uh, relative to the size of the venue that we'll have. So we'll know more about how we're going to manage those as well. But I do expect that 
basketball, hockey, gymnastics will be our winter sports that will provide a lot of good entertainment for our students along the way. Okay. Uh, let's turn to let's turn back to the plans for winter quarter. So this is for uh, Mary Clark again. Mary, there's a there's a uh, a couple of questions that I thought I'd throw at you. Um, you know, if you could elaborate a little bit more on our plans for winter quarter. Um, in particular, will do you have a spring break? Um, and what will be the re-entry, the reopening look like? Will, will students have to quarantine over winter break uh, before coming back? What do you think? So thank you for the questions. These are all the matters that we're trying to nail down currently. Uh, I'll be very uh, candid with you that we're working uh, with our faculty and our staff and our experts on campus. Uh, to think through how best to bring our students back to campus uh, in a healthy and safe manner. That also promotes the academic excellence and the opportunities for co-curricular activities that I mentioned before. Uh, we are looking at a, a sequenced return to campus over a period of several days. Um, potentially starting around January 3rd and moving forward from there. Uh, all of this is under discussion, uh, but to give you a sense of some of the factors we're considering, uh, we're thinking that uh, quarantining before classes start uh, is likely the optimal answer, but again, this is under discussion. Uh, we will have a robust program of testing here on campus. I think we did uh, 9,000 tests uh, for our community members returning to campus back in early September, and we anticipate something along those lines. Uh, again, uh, we would involve students as well as faculty and staff uh, in these testing protocols to um, promote our confidence uh, in the well being of our community. With regard to spring break, that is something that we are in active conversation about. Uh, we're mindful that many universities have canceled their spring breaks, um, but we're also mindful most of these universities are semester based um, while we're quarter based. So we have the winter quarter, uh, 10 weeks of instruction, uh, typically followed by a spring break and then followed by a spring quarter, another 10 weeks of instruction. And so we need to take many factors into account, uh, not the least of which uh, is the physical and mental well-being of our community members. Uh, so uh, we will be back with you uh, with more specifics, but wanted to give you a sense of all the considerations uh, that we're looking at. I did see a question related to this in the chat. <clears throat> as to what instructional um, uh, modalities we're offering this winter and spring. In other words, how will the classes be presented? And what we're anticipating is a very similar distribution of uh, classes in the winter and spring as we had in the fall. Uh, what we found was that it was a fairly neat distribution between the in-person uh, the online, and then uh, what we call hybrid. Uh, the in-person, uh, we have been able to incorporate remote students into the in-person classroom through a mechanism called HyFlex. Uh, and I anticipate we would be continuing to do that uh, come the winter and the spring quarters. Uh, but your students will still have choices as to how they wish to pursue their curricula uh, and again, I'd welcome any further questions about that. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'm going to um, ask Michael Lafar to come on the screen. Uh, there's a question, and and Todd Adams may also want to chime in here. There's a question about helping students cope uh, with the challenges of quarantine and isolation. And I just wondering how, if we could uh, just say a few things of how we're handling quarantine and isolation, how we're uh, making sure that the students are supported, both of course, through you know food and, and uh, a little bit of outdoor recreation, but also that very important mental health component as well. Thank you for the question, Chancellor. Um, 
Yes, one thing that we, a lesson learned that, um, you know, during this process, we found that quarantine in particular has been really challenging for our students in that they're in that waiting period and they're waiting to for their test results to come back and they the routines have, have been changed. So it's been very important for us to connect them socially, to connect them with additional support services so that they can feel that, you know, while they're in this moment of, of waiting to find out if, um, you know, if for their tests to come back, um, that they have connections to each other. So the counseling center has done a quarantine group, which is a which is a, a play on words for students who are in that space that want to connect with other students. We of course offer robust counseling services. Um, most of those are in, in uh, are virtual, but they we also do offer in person for those folks who need need that level of support. While folks are in quarantine, the RAs have been reaching the home RAs who have been reaching out to those folks in isolation and quarantine to give them that social that social connection. Each of the students is given a, um, an SOS, which is a, a case manager to be ensured that their needs are being met. In addition to, of course, the contact tracers giving them resources, as well as the counseling center reaching out to be sure that um, we want folks to know that we're here. This is a caring community. This is a, a community that looks after one another. And we want students to feel that in particular when they're in these vulnerable positions. Terrific. I might uh, add, yeah, I just might add uh, one thing, um, and uh, that is that we have begun working with Sarah Watamura and, and her great team to assess students um, as they're in isolation and quarantine, and particularly as they are, are coming out. Are there things about that experience that were particularly good that um, while it was unsettling to have to go in, um, that we need to make sure we continue and even bolster? And are there some gaps in things? And, and so after our first few weeks, we just stood up that assessment in the last week and are starting to gather those data. And that will be very important as we think about moving forward in how we can continue to support students as they go into either isolation or in quarantine. And you mentioned recreation and I, I, you know, Michael can talk maybe a little bit about this, but from an isolation standpoint, um, they can uh, have some connections within isolation because of course everyone is positive. Um, that is not the case in quarantine, which sometimes makes quarantine a little more difficult. Uh, so in working with, with Michael and others, being able to provide a little bit of time for students to get some outdoor recreation in, in small pockets uh, in order to um, get a little vitamin D, but also to um, um, have some connection outside, even if they're not able to meet individually with any student or anybody. So we've learned some things in the first few weeks, and that, is, that has been very helpful. I think our assessment will only help us do this better as we move forward. Terrific. Thank you, Todd. Um, stay on the stay on the line here for us, um, because there's some questions on uh, disciplinary actions uh, that I think the audience is pretty interested in. Um, in particular, you know, t why don't you walk the audience through what what we do once we know that perhaps there was um, some behavior that didn't follow protocols. And Sarah Watamura, you may want to chime in too on this tag team with Todd a little bit, but let's walk the audience through what we, what we do along the way so they're fully informed. Sure, and thank you for the question. And, and of course, um, every situation can be different, but if we understand that students, for instance, gathered um, in numbers beyond what we would allow um, for an unauthorized event, um, we will follow up and, and, and really we'll, we'll take two actions. I, I think first and foremost, we will, as we know about that, issue location restrictions um, for those students who were involved. And what that does for us, if a student lives on campus, asks that other than going and having a test, which we would request that they do, um, until such time that they get the results of that test, that they um, will um, quarantine in place, if you will, um, and will stay in their location if they're off campus that, um, and they, everybody would do their classes, even if they had some in person would do those remotely. If they're off campus, that they stay off campus pending the results of, of, of a test. 
um, before they would be allowed and have that location restriction lifted to come back on. And that is to protect the health and safety of not only that individual, but given the nature um, of COVID and the chance for spread, we want to know right up front if, if we have any issue that could lend itself to spread. Um, so there is that. The other thing that they will do is depending on whether an organization was involved, individuals, or it could be both, is that we would have follow-up through our students, student rights and responsibilities process. And so individual meetings would occur with somebody from our student rights and responsibility area or from our residential education area acting as, as conduct officers to follow up on the case and, and close out whatever we may need to, whether that's for the group or for the individual. Um, I'll invite Sarah if she has some other things, particularly as it relates to the testing component that we put in place as a key part of the location restriction. Sure, I'm happy to uh, join in the conversation. Um, we have, uh, the way we have approached it for both students in quarantine and for location restriction is to ask students or require them to have a test right away. And the idea there is that students are in social groups. So if they have um, been exposed or have been in a situation with multiple other students, we need to know right away if they're positive because if they're positive, they were in a compromised situation where they may have um, also transmitted the virus to others. Um, once we have that negative test, then um, whatever other disciplinary action is necessary um, has to do with other factors of the situation. So for example, if alcohol or drugs were involved, um, and those are pre-existing processes that, that happen in a non-COVID year. So the idea behind the testing is that we need to know before students are, are released from uh, restriction, whether they are positive and may have um, transmitted the virus to others in that group in that unsafe setting. Sarah, stay on the line here because um, I think there's an interesting question in the Q&A there. Um, and that is, uh, 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 someone is asking, are, is there a pattern as to how students are catching the virus that we're noticing here at the University of Denver? Um, you've got some really great data and some good observations. Why don't you share that with the group? Sure, um, so we do pretty extensive uh, what's called backward contact tracing to try to figure out where the patterns are, where are people um, potentially catching the virus, um, where do we see pockets. We uh, look at a number of different things. So we look at things like where are people physically located, what type of living arrangement, um, how, what type of shared bathroom space, um, even you know sort of what is the layout of that particular residence hall. Um, where are they in class? We look for patterns in classrooms. We look for uh, membership um, in different types of organizations. We look at year, unit, major, all of these kinds of things every time we get a, get a positive so that if we detect any kind of a pattern, we're able to um, aggressively go forward with it. And I would say that the most consistent pattern that we've seen um, tracking that data has to do with uh, congregate living. So, um, and this is consistent with what the city and state also sees. Um, this virus is just very likely to be translated, uh, transferred when people uh, cohabitate, right? So just like a common cold, it runs through a household. Um, that's, the, that's really where the action is at. And so we see that um, in congregate housing, both on and off campus, um, both official and unofficial. So you can see it run through an apartment or a house that uh, has a lot of roommates and that kind of thing. Um, of course, the best thing that students can do to restrict the chance of this happening is to restrict the number of people with whom they have close contact. So identifying a family group or a pod or whatever they want to call it of individuals that they're in that less than six feet for more than 15 minutes con close contact with, with or without a mask, it's the same um, in terms of how the city counts it, right? A close contact and then really trying to keep the number of those people down. And the recommendation is under 10, but the, you know, four would be fewer chances of getting, um, getting the virus than, than 10, right? So just like you would in a family. Um, so those are our kind of our top recommendations. There are a couple other things that have come up in the questions I was typing um, that I can just answer now. So uh, uh, individuals in a single can have another person from a single in their room. Um, so someone was asking, can they have this social pod up to four? The singles are small rooms, and that's why we can't go up to four in the room. But uh, individuals living in a single are also welcome to identify a pod of individuals that they're in close contact with, right? And, and try to spend more time with those folks and less time with others. 
Um, and, and that's definitely something you can uh, go ahead and do. And the other question was, can you ever quarantine in your own room if you have a private room? If you have a private room with a private bathroom with your own ability to have um, like a refrigerator and a microwave, that kind of thing, then yes, you could quarantine in your own space, but you do have to be able to have your own restroom, have your own sleeping space and have the ability to have food or else you um, can't quarantine in, that own, in your space alone. Um, and that's why we have um, so many spaces reserved around campus and uh, in the Denver area to support students who need to quarantine. Chancellor, if, if I could add a couple of things that I think also came up as Sarah was, was giving some really important um, answers there. In talking about location restriction, if a student is on location restriction, how long does that last? And of course, it depends on when they can go and have a test and then receive the negative result. But assuming that they can go uh, within the day and get it um, get tested, generally speaking, and it's not altogether, um, you know, we, we rely on our partnerships for this and doing the testing, but um, generally within a day of the test, we will have the results. So if they have a negative test, typically we've seen location restrictions last two to maybe three days at, at the uh, outset. Um, but it could be longer depending on a student getting in for testing and getting that test back. The other thing is if a student lives on campus and is location restricted, uh, during that time, we will deliver meals. So everything other than going for that test will get brought to them. And so we have three meals that will come each, each day to a student from um, our dining services. So that was a question I saw pop up as well. Terrific. Um, so here's a question. This is uh, back to Provost Clark, Mary. Um, uh, let's talk about grading systems. There's a question of, um, is there, will there be an option for pass or no pass for any classes this fall, winter, and spring due to the unique class arrangements? So that is not something that has been um, determined at this time. Right now we're moving forward with our regular grading scheme. Uh, it may be uh, that if circumstances change, that's something that we need to consider. I uh, do know in this regard that there's some understanding uh, that graduate students are differently situated. Uh, than undergrad. Uh, so at any rate, uh, right now we're moving forward with the um, regular grading scheme, uh, but there may be some uh, change of circumstances uh, that would support a move to the pass, uh, no pass. I will uh, take advantage of having the mic to address one of the questions that I saw in the chat about instructional modalities and providing feedback about the efficacy of them. Uh, I would strongly encourage, it was a student who posted the question, I would strongly encourage you to share feedback uh, with the chair of the department or the director of the program in which this particular course was offered, or alternatively to share feedback with your academic advisor or even with the Dean's Office of the unit in which the course was offered. Uh, but we very much welcome your feedback. Uh, this is uh, an iterative process. Uh, as we said at the outset, uh, we've learned from the fall quarter for the winter and spring planning. Uh, likewise, we're learning uh, from the efficacy of these instructional modalities, the feedback that we're getting from the students and incorporating that in real time. So please don't uh, hesitate. Uh, to provide your feedback. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'm going to, uh, there's a question here that I think stemmed from the original, one of the original questions about whether to move out at the end of the fall quarter here. Um, we've got families that are on the coast. And so coordinating that is quite challenging for them. Um, they want to know more details about moving out their first year's um, sons, things out, uh, how difficult that would be. Well, in the event, and I, I think, Thomas, we want to clarify uh, with the audience that the intent is that we will have people keep their um, materials and their dorm stuff in the residence halls. But in this rare event, I think we want to just assure them that the university will develop plans on how storage might be facilitated of that nature. So Todd or, or Thomas, either one of you maybe want to take that question. 
Uh, sure, Chancellor. There, that, uh, we actually got that question in in one of the Q and A's. Yes, again, the intention right. is to do that, and if we if we have to move to a, a place where we're not able to have folks stay, we will um, provide uh, options for shipping and moving, and all of those options. Yeah. I think the only other thing that I would say, and, and some parents have already reached out to us about this, just as a reminder, it's a little bit of a longer winter recess than typical. And so while students may have brought less with them uh, on the front end, um, given what we had asked, um, and I think by and large, most people subscribe to that, um, we do know that people are going to be gone longer, maybe traveling to some different places, and it may require them to, as a result, take more. So just as a reminder, it will be a slightly longer break um, and making sure that, that students are prepared to take with them what they will need, because once we lock up those rooms, our intent would not be uh, to go back in and have to gather any material for anybody. So um, to the best of, of everybody's ability, taking with you what you will need for the period. And, and we do plan on being here in the winter. And with that being the case, our hope is that everything can, can remain, knowing that people will want to pack accordingly for the break. Terrific. Thank you, Todd. Um, a question here, uh, I, and I, I think it's for a regular spring commencement. There's a question here from uh, parents or grandparents about graduating students and what is the plan for graduation? Um, uh, it, will they be able to attend something face-to-face -face or, or are we already planning a virtual ceremony? Um, I, Mary and I can probably answer that one. So um, I, it's safe to say that we are not planning a virtual ceremony at this point in time. Where we left off our commencements um, is the following. Uh, we did decide to uh, postpone the commencement for the class that graduated in 2020. That would be June or in August of 2020. And we announced at that point in time that we would have a face-to-face -face ceremony uh, for those people who are able to attend in the spring of 2021. That is still our intention. Um, our intention is also to have a ceremony for those who will be graduating in 2021 anyway as well. So we'll have two ceremonies is the current plan. Um, it will of course completely depend on the protocols that are in place, uh, the health and safety that we can deliver at that point in time. Um, but it is my hope, uh, I think it's Provost Clark's hope that we will be able to celebrate uh, the accomplishments of your students in face-to-face -face real time uh, come June of 2021. Mary, would you like to add anything to that? No, that was quite comprehensive. So I'm happy to address any follow-up questions. Provost Clark and I had the, um, had the delightful opportunity to have our pictures taken with a number of uh, graduating seniors and graduate students in August after they graduated at the end of the summer, uh, as well as uh, uh, Interim Provost Corrine Lengsfeld uh, with myself back in June. So that was delightful. Um, we have, uh, of course, time for just a couple more questions and I'm going to just pick some from the Q&A here. Um, let's see. Um, uh, there's a question about airlines and uh, shutting uh, a number of flights, making it more difficult for the students to get back home and back to Denver. Um, and there was another question about making sure that uh, we consult with parents on our testing before students um, leave for a home at the end of the fall quarter, because Thanksgiving is a time of multi-generation celebrations, and we want everyone to be healthy and safety for those as well. So um, Sarah, talk to us a little bit about how we might gather more information about uh, testing before they leave uh, for home. Yeah, that was a great suggestion um, and not one that I'd actually heard before. So um, in the, in the Q&A with the parent who raised it, uh, we went back and forth a little bit and decided um, it would make sense to pull both students and parents to understand what the volume of demand would be. And then we would need to work with National Jewish to make sure that we could meet that demand. Um, overall, I, I was not expecting high volume at the, the couple of weeks before we leave. Um, 
and we would have capacity likely to to meet um, to meet increased demand over uh, over what we would expect based on people's um, baseline behavior. So I think that is something that we could do, and we'll try to get a handle on what the numbers would be so that we can plan accordingly. And and Mary, talk a little bit about um, how the end of the quarter will play out in terms of finals and when uh, when they can expect to start making arrangements for students to come on home. I think the last day of classes is the 20th of November. That's exactly right. And so then there's a grace period over the holiday so that folks can enjoy themselves and also prepare for exams. Uh, and then final assessments would follow, I uh, believe, starting November 30th. Uh, someone had asked in the chat whether all final assessments are in the form of exams, and the answer is no. Uh, it's really for the faculty member to determine how best to assess the learning outcomes, which is to say, did the students uh, master the um, material and skills intended to be uh, gained uh, through that course. These assessments can be done through exams, uh, but also can be done through final projects and through final papers. And I imagine your students will see a distribution of these types of assessments. Terrific, thank you. Um, I think the I think the last two questions I'm going to ask Todd Adams to uh, sign in and uh, take a whack at here. Um, the one, here's a one question. They have a student that was subject to location restriction, uh, but the meal issue uh, was, seemed highly unresolved to them. Uh, they, he said that they had to be ordered in advance and he didn't know that he'd be, uh, how to do that exactly. There were a lot of takeouts, for example, um, can the meal situation be worked out for kids in location restriction, quarantine, and isolation? Um, the, the, uh, the person went on to write, though, that the dashboard is extremely helpful to them and um, glad that we are making that available to parents and students and the rest of the community members here. So, Todd, do you want to just talk a little bit more about uh, the, uh, the process of food during these restrictions? Sure. So once we know that... Uh... Uh, location restriction is in place, then we're in touch with the student um, about the ordering of their meals. So we don't just drop off any meal. We certainly give students um, agency and choice given dietary needs and restrictions so that they can choose. We sometimes have students that go on a location restriction at a, at a time when it might be after we have delivered meals for the day and before um, they have had a chance to eat. So in a couple of occasions, we've had to work sort of in, in tandem with the student to get something delivered um, in an off cycle. But once we get them on the cycle, they have the ability to choose um, for delivery what gets delivered to them. Um, I know early on, and I will say early on in the first couple of weeks, I think we were kind of building capacity um, and working with our, our colleagues in dining services to do so. So we had, um, depending on where the location was, um, a, a few more challenges. So it's something that from um, our standpoint, we've had to improve and, and we didn't do as well as we would have wanted in some cases early on. I think in this last week or two, um, we've seen that, that shift, at least based on the feedback that we've gotten. So um, that's been important, but we, we have somebody that's working um, really in, in almost full-time nature to coordinate the logistics and even pull in as we need to dining um, other facility folks um, and student outreach and support. Somebody that's really um, in a position to see all of this and make sure that the student during the time, whether it's a location restriction or um, even as a result of location restriction has to transfer into either quarantine or isolation, that we can manage that as smoothly as possible knowing that it can be a bit disruptive um, and maybe even more than a bit disruptive, particularly if it wasn't expected. So um, it's something we're working on. We've gotten, I think, quite a bit better at um, and happy to talk with uh, a parent individually and can, can certainly reach out to me about that um, as it relates to a unique need or situation. Fantastic, Todd, thank you. We are at the end of our hour here. And so we're going to call it to a close. Uh, on behalf of all of us here at the University of Denver, we hope that this uh, town hall for parents and families was beneficial, that uh, we answered many of your questions, um, and more importantly, that 
Um, we gave you an assurance that the university is working so, so hard to make sure that number one, your student is healthy and safe at the University of Denver. And number two, that they are having a, a very good educational experience here at the university in face-to-face -face manner where they get to connect with faculty as well as their fellow students. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it, is, it takes a very large team of individuals working across this big university of faculty and staff to really make this work. Um, and they have risen to that challenge and I couldn't be prouder of the work that everyone is doing to make this a really great experience for your students. This is being recorded, so you will be able to have access to uh, this town hall meeting uh, and we'll make sure that information of where you get the recording is available to you as well. I wanna just thank everyone again for showing up and participating. I wanna thank the panelists and the off uh, video panelists as well for answering many of the questions in the Q&A. But I especially wanna thank the parents and the families uh, for showing up today and uh, entrusting their education um, with the University of Denver. With that, I thank everyone and we wish you a very good day. Thanks for joining us everyone, bye-bye.